Game Informer just dropped pictures and info about Spyro. So, let's break it down. What's up guys, Canadian Guy A here, and for the past few days, there has been nothing but Spyro news and footage. It's really painful to see information come out while I'm at work, so when I get home, I immediately have to get to editing and script writing. And today was no different. Game Informer was able to try a few levels and wrote about it, and they got some screenshots and concept pieces along with it. I'm making a two-part video showing off all the stuff we have gotten so far from the Spyro and Toys for Bob Twitter, so keep an eye out for those. But not only that, but they included a bunch of info about the actual development of the game and how it was brought together. Before we get to that though, let's go to the images and see what we have here. First off, we have the Druid, who honestly looks amazing. You can see though, however, that he is going to annoy the bits out of you. Next up, we got the Electrifying Nork from Beast Makers, and he honestly looks amazing. He looks like the 90s punk cool kid who thought the Power Glove was cool. Next up, we got another image of the Snowballing Norks from Ice Cavern. We have seen this guy a few times before, and still, it's really cool to see pretty much anything coming from these games. Here's another angle of the same picture, seeing more of what is behind Sparks. Next, we have a wide shot of Magic Crafters. Once again, it's only a concept art, but just to see what they're thinking and going with is really intriguing and, well, awesome. I love the water down here, it just looks so nice. Next up, we got a double whammy. We got this image of... The Beast from Alpine Ridge, and honestly, this is my favorite image out of all the ones that were released today. They captured the look and the feeling of the first Beast, and man, was I scared of him as a child. Looking back now, he doesn't look that scary, but now they brought the fear back with this animal, and now went back to square one again. This thing is terrifying. But a quick shout out to Blaze over on Twitter as she pointed something out. There was this second picture of the beast chasing Spyro, but there seems to be a subtle difference, like a camera angle change, like as if there was a few frames forward of a video clip. This might mean that there is a new trailer floating around. If you look at the other two angles from before as well of the snowballing Nork, there's a subtle difference. Could these images be the trailer to be played at E3? Perhaps before E3? Who knows? Next up, we got some concept art for Toasty. Still looking as creepy as ever, but uh, let's remove that disguise. There we go. That's the Toasty we know and love. To be able to see the thought process behind these characters is honestly so cool. I got two more pieces and then we will go to the news pieces. The first one is concept art of, once again, Ice Cavern. It looks really great, but also has an ancient creepy vibe to it. Like as if this area was inhabited before by some kind of ancient race. The last piece is a part of a banner from Game Informer talking about the games announced coming this year. And in it is a new position of Spyro with an expression looking up in, once again, Ice Cavern. Now, I know over the past few days, a lot of concept art has been coming out, but do not worry, I'm going to cover it all sometime soon. Now, onwards to the news bits. There's really four areas that were talked about in the Game Informer article. The first one is, quote, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy was a critical and commercial success, leading many to believe that Activision would explore Spyro the Dragon's history next. Activision made this decision well before the launch of the Insane Trilogy. So Activision had plans that Spyro was coming quite a bit before Crash had come out. We can assume that even when Crash was pitched for a remaster, Spyro could have been right beside him, or right on his coattails. However, with Spyro being such a larger game to contend with, they likely needed more time. This correlates with the fact that Crash had the Spyro demo code on it. The next piece of information is really interesting as well. Quote, The big change fans of the PlayStation games will see is every Elder Dragon has been redesigned. We had a chance to see one, which Spyro frees after exiting the art gallery. Toys for Bob wants each dragon to hammer home the theme of the world they inhabit. This particular one holds a paint tray, wears a stylish cap, and sports a tiny mustache. None of the dragons are just palette swaps. I shall call him Francois. 
Well, this is quite interesting because there are a lot of different kinds of worlds in Spyro, from bogs to robots, and if a dragon is going to be a representative of each world, we're going to see some interesting looking dragons. Now the next piece of information was something I was wondering about for, well, months, and finally it gets answered today. Quote, Toys for Bob rebuilt all the games from scratch in Unreal Engine 4 and developed tools to extract as much data from Insomniac's games as possible. It wasn't the actual source assets, however, says Peter Kavik, senior producer at Toys for Bob. The tool allowed us to map out the precious placement of objects in the world and the lines things traveled on. We have all of the accurately captured and recreated here. Insomniac was able to rely on the exact level meshes and use them for paintovers for the artists. They also used the original collision meshes to deliver what is essentially the exact same experience, but with a fresh coat of paint. The original game is basically running under a bunch of layers. Just like the Crash Insane trilogy, they were able to extract the exact placements of the items in the levels and were able to make the same collision mesh. This game will pretty much be exactly the same as the originals, and that makes me incredibly happy. Now something that people have been talking about in my comment section a lot is the music by the masterful Stuart Copeland. Well, I got one more piece of info for you guys, and it talks about it. Quote, Composer Stuart Copeland's original scores are being used, but the music is now dynamic, shifting in tone when Spyro moves from exploration to combat. It's a small change that goes a long way in heightening the moment of facing off against Toasty the Scarecrow. They are using the original scores! They are not faithfully recreated like Crashes. It is Stuart Copeland's originals. But, according to a great friend of mine, Mechanizer8, who is a fantastic composer, said that they would be using the original MIDI files, which can then be put to different instruments. Now, you might say, yeah, well, he's just a small YouTuber. Why should I believe him? Well, he has put together faithful recreations of Stuart's work before. In fact, for the past few minutes, you have been hearing his recreation of Glimmer. Yeah, he's that good. This is his. So why don't you go check out his channel in the description? But the article also mentions that they are using dynamic music so that when Spyro goes to the battle, the music changes slightly. Some voice a little concerned, but I honestly think it's going to be very subtle. Almost like you feel it instead of really hearing it.